So I'd like to welcome you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Dr. Jim Saeed. My wife Rhonda will be here tomorrow morning and she'll be leading out the Sabbath school and we'll do the sermon together. And then tomorrow afternoon at two, there's another lecture that I'll do um, that I look forward to a lot. And then tomorrow evening at 6.30, we'll do a, a question and answer process that I've done many, many times, especially in Southern Oregon, where I was in practice for 43 years. And we get together every month and people just fire questions one after the next. And it's just like being in practice. I enjoyed it thoroughly. So bring your questions for you, about you, your families, whatever you'd like, and I'm happy to address health issues. So I'd like to begin this presentation with a moment of prayer, if you'll join me. So Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your blessing that we can present this at all. Thank you that you alone are the one that heals. All to your honor and glory alone. I ask your Holy Spirit to guide this study and this presentation, that it may touch the hearts and minds of those that hear, that they may see the glory of you and your laws of health. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have a question. Um, it's loaded. How many of you are healthy? Good. How many of you think you're healthy, but you're not? <laughs> How many would like to be healthy? Okay. So my question first is, what does health mean? People usually define health, and I do this more as interactive, but I'm far away from you guys, so I'll pretend it's interactive. So when I talk to my patients about health, the typical response is health means I don't, I'm not sick. I have no symptoms, no signs, I'm not hurting, therefore I'm fine. And I have to tell you that when I work with patients, and I've done this for 45 years now, in clinical practice, yes, or still in practice, in Orofino. When I check chemistries, I check food reactivities, I check hormonal balances, and I find that people are not well, even though they think they are. They can be much better. And they're always surprised to see something going on, because they said, when I went to see my doctor, typically an MD, which is fine, they said I was fine. And I said, well, let me show you how we do this. So I'll run chemistries, and if you don't see an abnormal, you say, you're fine. If you see a slight abnormality, but it's not a big issue, you're fine. Come back later when you're sicker, and we can do something about it. And they said, that, that's exactly what they told me. I said, okay, you have this, this, this going on. Here are the drugs you take. I'll see you in six months. They said, that's exactly what they told me. I said, now let's, let's look at it from a different perspective, from a health perspective, from a wellness perspective. I look at the chemistries. It takes about a half an hour and or longer, 45 minutes, because you're putting together information to understand why the person is experiencing what they are. And then a person starts to understand what's actually going on in their physiology. And then we work to optimize that physiology. So on this line, it's called the wellness line. Can you all see that okay? Yeah. I hope, good. So on the left, everyone acknowledges that that's a state of disease or injury. You have signs, you have symptoms. Signs are something that someone else observes about you, like serum calcium or serum iron. Symptoms are something you, you, you know yourself. You hurt, you itch, you tingle. That's a symptom. Normal is the absence of signs and symptoms. But there's something beyond that we call optimal health or optimal physiology that's optimized chemistry, optimized hormones, optimized diet, so that the body starts improving progressively more than a person ever thought possible. I have many, many patients that come to me saying, I want to feel better than I feel now. I'm okay, but I know I can feel better. And I'm grateful for that kind of patient. So who's ever heard of the normal curve or normal distribution? It's in statistics. So if you take a population of anything, amoeba or light bulbs or people, and you measure something about them, you see there's an average, and then there's outliers from the average. That is called the bell-shaped curve. You ever heard of that one? In statistics, it's called the normal distribution. Medicine adopted that word normal, and they call something normal if it falls within what's called two standard deviations from the average, from the mean, which means you see in the middle, I'll show you. That distribution looks like this. So on the outliers, the outlying areas, that's 5% 
total. So it's 2.5% on the up side and 2.5% on the downside. That's technically called abnormal. So if you look at the chemistry and it says abnormal, it's out in that area typically. So that's regarded as abnormal. Normal is within the two standard deviation range. Now you know how much of the population that encompasses? If the outlier is two and a half, two and a half, that's 5%. What's on the inside of those? 95%. So if you're normal, you're as sick as 95% of the population. Technically, that's all it means. So instead, we look at a much finer area that we call optimal. It's a very narrow range. It's determined by research for each, every single parameter on chemistries and hormones, et cetera. So we study those things, and we apply them in practice. So to optimize physiology is very different than normalizing physiology. You see the difference? Normalizing, you're like 95% of the population optimized, is much narrower, and it's optimized for each individual. And that's what's critically important. Now, I want to point out some very basic concepts of health. <clears throat> and most of this comes from Spirit of Prophecy. Now, I came to Adventism late in life. I was 52. And when I read uh, two books, Ministry of Healing and Councils on Diet and Foods, you've heard of those two books? If you haven't read, about, if you haven't read them, read them. They're outstanding. When I read those, I thought, uh, the writer of this is a prophet. No one told me she was a prophet, but I get she was a prophet. Because she was writing things back in the 1800s that weren't known at all back then, that are proven to be true now. So I was in awe. And those are the foundations of naturopathic medicine in this country. So I appreciate the roots of my profession. And the, the first concept is healing is not the forced or artificial removal of signs and symptoms. Healing is not that. There's no force involved in healing. And that's a huge statement. We'll come back to it again. It is the natural process of improving and optimizing physiology and tissue integrity, as well as character and relationships. Now, many people think about health in their body alone. Does it stop there? That was a rhetorical question. It can't stop there. So the quality of our physical body affects the quality of our character and the quality of our relationships. Now, when Jesus came to be with us, as God with us, Emmanuel, his first advent, what's the first thing he began to do? He healed people. He healed them of every manner of condition, every demonic possession, any illness they had, Anything, he healed them by faith. He had to heal them first so they could hear the message of the gospel. He came to teach the everlasting gospel, which is Christ. And so for, the, for humanity to be able to take that in, they had to be well enough to understand that. And that's going to be a, a central theme of tonight's talk. If our brain is not cleansed, and not intact. We can't hear the messages of heaven. And if we do, we can't understand them. We can't fathom what the Lord is telling us. So my question is this. Do you want to hear the messages of heaven? Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Do you want to understand God's word? And be moved by the Holy Spirit and be able to perceive what you're being inspired to understand. It requires a healthy brain. Now, I have to tell you, when I was in practice of about... Oh, 40 plus years, I decided to go back and get um, certified in functional neurology. I, I love the field. And so I thought, I've not been in school for like 40 years, 45 years. Uh, this would be interesting, 40 years. So I started taking a course called Lumosity. Have you ever heard of that? I recommend it. Lumosity.com. Not luminosity, but lumosity. L-U-M-O-S-I-T-Y.com. It's a series of programs, games, developed by neurologists to develop functionality of the brain. And it works. So I took that course for about three months. It was like playing games every night. It was terribly addictive, by the way, so I had to stop. So, but we enjoyed it. My wife and I would play those games. And the, my brain started thinking differently and more efficiently. It worked. So I could actually take the course in functional neurology and understand the material. So the brain is plastic. 
meaning it can remodel itself and learn more efficiently. Now, another part of the brain is highly significant. Have you ever had brain damage? You all have. If you're born, you start with brain damage. Not because you're born, but the brain immediately starts losing neurons from birth. And you have many more neurons at birth than you have, say, at two years old. Because some of those neurons in the brain are neurons that carry other neurons to where they belong, and they do not eat anymore, so they die off. So you have a set of neurons in your brain by two that are there for your life, but they die over time. You lose quite a few every hour. Um, that may be sobering, and it should be, but we lose brain cells routinely. And so we lose functionality. However, the brain, by the Lord's grace, has the capacity to create new neural networks. What does that mean? Nerves connect to each other to create an avenue of ability. Like, for example, writing, reading, standing on one leg, playing basketball, or whatever you do. Reaching for a cup of water and drinking it and not missing. And those are big deals. We don't think of it because we've learned how to do that with ease. But if a person can't do that, they think about it and it's a big issue. So we train people functionally to create new networks in their brain. Now, you know how long it takes for a network to begin to form? We watch this under electron micrographs. It takes seconds for a, a neuron to connect to another neuron to start learning new pathways to make up for the damage that was done from other neurons that are dead. So as you practice new things, like I did with Lumosity, for example, or you're learning a skill and you practice it, your brain creates networks or pathways it didn't have before. That's good news, by the way, because we work with many people that have brain dysfunction that they can start regaining. We do it through practicing and also through neurochemistry, which is, we'll get to that one later. So, healing leads not only to resolution of disease, but also to increase energy. How many people are fatigued? It used to be the most common symptom I dealt with until insomnia became the most common symptom I deal with in the older population. Improved sleep is a healing response. Reduce pain and inflammation, that's huge. Do you know that inflammation is behind every pathology, including cancer? So inflammation is a big issue to your body. And we'll look at how that goes out of control and how you can bring it back into control leads to healthy relationships and an overall sense of well-being. Now, I love this quote. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. One thing I started studying back in college, to know God. That was my, year, my search and my yearning. But I couldn't find him in organized religion in my early life. And who, who attended the, the uh, talk I did on my testimony? A few? Okay. That was here, and that was, I forget how long ago. But, so some of you know where I come from that way. So, uh, on my journey, one of the things I began to search out was science and physics and engineering. I thought, I want to see how God works through his laws. And I was amazed at how fixed and perfect his laws are in the physical realm. There's over 400 laws that we know about that have to be met perfectly for life to exist the way it does here. That's the precision of God. So when we veer from his laws of health also, if we veer from his moral laws, if we veer from his physical laws, there's consequences that are devastating. So disease is an effort to right the system. People get so anxious to get rid of a symptom that they lose sight of why the symptoms are there. But the symptoms lead you from, from cause to effect if you follow the train properly. And then you begin to understand how to deal with those symptoms ac accurately. Now, this is a strong and possibly controversial statement, but I respect its veracity. Restorative power is not in drugs, but in nature. 
Now, in my background in naturopathic medicine, I'm a chiropractor and naturopath. In naturopathic medicine, we learn both pharmaceutical medicine and we learn natural health care, botanical medicine, nutrition, and diet. So I've studied both, and my licenses let me prescribe both. So I prescribe drugs to help people come off of them so we can start reducing dosing as much as we possibly can. Um, and for some people, that's just where they live, and I work with them from there, and we just slowly, slowly escort them to where else they can be. But drugs don't heal. The Lord does. And Sister White had a lot to say about that, which I'll touch on in a moment. Now, this is, this is big. Nature's to be assisted. What's that word? What did I say? Assisted. assisted. Thank you. Nature's to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities to reestablish right conditions in the system. So that's two statements. We assist the body in nature to get rid of garbage. And tomorrow, we're going to have, we're going to have a talk about a law called the Law of Dissipative Structures, for which a Nobel Prize was given in 1977 in chemistry, to Ilya Prigogine. And he showed exactly how this works. So tomorrow, stay tuned. We'll look at the details of that. But what this shows us is first you have to get rid of garbage. Now, what happens if you keep putting garbage into a body of water, but you never drain it? What does it become? A cesspool. A cesspool. That's right. And what happens if something dies or is dying and has to convert back to dust? What does that? Fungi. Okay? So it becomes a uh, our disease I call a state of premature composting in a cesspool. So we're composting early. We're still walking around in this cesspool that's composting. Not a good situation. So you have to clear the body of garbage first drain the cesspool, and then reestablish right conditions so the system can heal and stop the process of a premature composting issue. And tomorrow we'll look at what that looks like. Now, this is the last piece. Nature's process of healing and upbuilding is what? Is it fast or slow? It's gradual. And, the, and to the impatient, it seems slow. Now, I get asked this often in practice. Doc, how long will it take? I'd love to say as long as it's going to take, but I, I don't want to appear impudent. So I say, in my experience, this can go from days to months. I said, I've held the hand of many a patient through four to six months of, of healing, usually four months at the outside, typically, sometimes longer. Some people respond very quickly, but that's a beginning response. But for recovery, for optimal health to begin to make itself known, is measured in months to years. And patients realize it. Yep, I've been at this for how many decades, and I wanted to recover all at once? Would that it work that way? But there's laws that govern how we recover, how long it takes, and the process involved in doing that. So impatience doesn't work. In the end, it will be found that nature untrammeled does it work wisely and well? I love the word untrammeled. Um, don't mess with nature. <laughs> Let the Lord work the way the Lord works to cleanse the body and regenerate and restore tissue in chemistry. So the law of dissipated structures is what we're going to start on tomorrow. Now, let me go to another part here. Can you read that? White on blue? Okay. So, uh, there's a series of slides of a lecture series we did. I don't remember where. We had to fly somewhere. And they videotaped all this. And uh, have you ever seen 3ABN? Yes. And there's a series called, uh, oh, come on, From Sickness to Health. Okay. So Rico Hill was presenting that, and he asked me to present with him. So he and I did this series together also. I think we might have been in Spokane or something like that. At any rate, um, I'm using just excerpts from this, because I love how it ties together with this. So when we were created, our first parents, we were created perfectly in the image and likeness of God. That was our uh, birthright. 
originally. And we fell. Now, th these two quotes really strike me. Look at how close we are to the heart of God. What is man that thou shouldst magnify him, that thou shouldst set thine heart upon him? I think I, 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 it boggles my mind, I have to tell you. I'm in prayer in the morning, and I'm praying to the Lord, and I'm realizing, Lord, I'm praying silently, and you're hearing my very words as thoughts. You who are on high, in, in the third heaven, I don't even ask me what that means. Okay, I, I, I read about where it is and all this, but <laughs> I look forward to the experience of it someday. But right now I just have this mental construct, which I don't pay much attention to, because anything I can imagine about God is wrong. I can't even begin to comprehend. But here is the God of the universe, or of all dimensions, or wh whatever you call that. And he's hearing my voice silently speaking a prayer. What is man that God should hear us and magnify us? And in Psalms 8, 4, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visits him. He visits him. So God is mindful of each one of us. We're in his heart. We're in his attention. He wants each one of us to be fully restored into his image and likeness, to be recreated in Christ. So I just looked at this collage of humanity. And when I look at the faces of each person, each person I see in practice, each person I encounter anywhere where I am, I just watch people. And my heart goes out to them. Each one is suffering in their own way, silently. Some not so silently. And I only know that because of what I see in practice. So, and if a person isn't suffering, they don't even know it. They don't realize that they're poor, blind, naked, and miserable, and, and in need of a savior. Mm. I'm not going through this one. So the Lord has made us as a place in which he wants to dwell. Christ himself called his body a temple, where the Lord dwells. He said, we are a temple, a living temple. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, know you not that you are the temple of God, that the spirit of God dwells in you? Um, let that one in. Just let that one in. God yearns to dwell in each one of us. What's the mystery of godliness? Christ in you, the hope of glory his very character. And Paul says, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? You ever realize that? We're not our own. To whom do we belong? We are bought with a price. What was the price that was paid for us? The full treasure of heaven, the life of Christ. Therefore, glorify God, glorify God. Where? In your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to him. Now, if someone came along and handed you something incredibly precious, and they said, uh, this isn't yours, but I'm going to just loan it to you. You get to be a steward of this. Don't mess up. If we have any respect for that person, we're going to be very careful of how we deal with that precious commodity. Is the body precious? Is life precious? Beyond anything else. And the Lord gave it to us. It's a gift. He bought it. He said, I want you to be a steward of this body, of this spirit. Now, what happened to our spirit at the fall of man? Whose spirit did we adopt? Anybody? Pardon? Satan, the spirit of self. That's the greatest tyrant of all, self. So Satan was absorbed with self, we're absorbed with the same spirit of Satan, self. So when we fell, we couldn't be held accountable. What's the first thing Adam and Eve did? <laughs> he did it, she did it, you made him do it. 
they would not accept responsibility at all. So the carnal mind cannot be responsible for itself. It will justify itself. It will make those aprons to hide its nakedness, the shame of its nakedness. That's what the carnal mind does. So, have you ever noticed that in relationship? If I can bring it very close to home, for each one of us, no one's immune. I'm a card-carrying member. I deal with this in myself all the time. It's hard to be wrong. We're always wanting to be right in our own eyes, even though our spouse is happy to tell us, no, you're not. But do we want to admit that? When Satan was told what you're doing in heaven is wrong, he was ready to admit it until pride overcame him, led to his ultimate demise. That's the nature of what pride does. So what does the Lord ask us to do in Romans? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, this is his plea, that you present your bodies a living what? A living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, as the mind is transformed, so is the body. But the body has to be in a state where a transformed can actually function. A transformed mind can function. Now, I want to look at a couple of, of major quotes here. The laws of nature are the laws of God, as truly divine as are the precepts of the Decalogue. Now, let that one in. The laws of nature, the laws of health, the laws that govern how we heal are as divine as the Ten Commandments. Did you catch that? They're as divine as the Ten Commandments. Why? Because they're given by the Lord. The laws that govern our physical organism, God has written upon every nerve, muscle, and fiber of the body. And as we start looking at the body gently today and tomorrow, uh, whether we could spend a week just on that alone, it's, it's incredible, just to get a, a sense of the awesomeness of how it put together. I used to teach dissection, human dissection, in gross anatomy in medical school. And the one thing that amazed me is there's a name for everything in the body. Every, every minute, every small millimeter, micrometer of the body has a name. There's a lot of names going on here. But we've followed what, what this looks like. We did a, uh, I'll appreciate, appreciate this. A few years back, we were in the uh, University of Central Florida at a brain dissection seminar. There were a hundred of us neurologists from around the world attending a seminar on brain dissection. There are 47 brains that we all dissected. And it was a hospital, it was a teaching hospital. And two people died the day we were there and they brought in their brains fresh. It may sound disgusting, but to me it was incredible. I'd never seen a fresh brain, only a, a brain that had been fixed with formalin, so it was solid. But a fresh brain you can't even hold in your hand. It'll spill. It's fluid. Every single person that was in that seminar came away believing in God. You can't look at that and, and realize, how does that do what we know the brain does? It's not possible. This mush of fluid functions as a brain only by God's design and his grace and his hand. No other way. And everyone there came away with that same understanding. The body boggles the mind. It's not billions and billions of years of chance to create this. Impossible. In fact, you know that evolutionists themselves have proven evolution wrong. And I love one evolutionist statement. He said, the likelihood of evolution being true is to take an arrow, shoot it, have it travel 100 light years, and hit a target one inch in diameter. I rest my case. Okay. The laws that govern our physical organism, written upon every nerve, muscle, and fiber of the body, every careless or willful violation of these laws is a sin against our Creator. Well, so do you know that it's a sin to snack? Did I say that? It's in spirit of prophecy. Why? 
It's a violation of the law of God. Do you know how? How long does it take to empty the stomach and the small intestines of of your last meal of a plant-based diet? Five to six hours. Four hours, minimum. Four hours minimum. Longer if it's a heavier meal or you have more difficult things to digest. It's an hour at least to empty the stomach and three hours of what are called 90-minute migrating motor complexes to empty the small intestines. So that goes twice. So it's at least four hours, preferred five to six. Now, what happens if you eat between meals? In that time, the body's trying to digest and assimilate what you last eat, the last ate. You interrupt the digestive sequence. So now you don't finish digesting, especially the proteins, and undigested proteins is seen and tagged by your immune system as a foreign protein, and the body tries to get rid of it. So you form antibodies against that foreign protein that you made foreign because you ate too soon and never finished digesting it. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah? Good. So now what happens is your immune system attacks those foreign proteins because they don't belong there. You can't use them. They're not broken down to amino acids to use them. So those antibodies attack other tissues in your body and cross the blood-brain barrier and affect the brain's immune system called the microglial system. Now the brain inflames. And you start attacking other tissues, and eventually you can create autoimmune conditions. It's called molecular mimicry. You have molecules that look just like what you just ate that the body's attacking, like your thyroid gland or adrenals or the liver or the cerebellum of the brain. We measure 55 of these, and we find many people reactive to different structures looking like foods they ate. Is that a problem? You're making yourself sicker over time, and you're damaging your brain. And when you damage your brain, you can't hear the messages of heaven. Is that important? So snacking is a sin. That's why I say that. And that's why it's put that way in spirit of prophecy. She may not have known all of that, but she understood the bottom line of it. We're now understanding why behind many of those concepts. And we'll be discussing other laws as we go. Let's go here. The influence of the mind on the body, as well as the body and the mind, should be emphasized. The electric power of the brain, promoted by mental activity, vitalizes the entire system, the whole system, and is thus an invaluable aid in resisting disease. Now, if you don't properly charge your brain, then this can't happen. Now, the way the brain charges is beautiful. And I'm not going to spend much time on it right now, because I don't I want there's other things I want to get to. But tomorrow when we look at the body structure, we're going to look at this. Uh, it, yeah. There are things going on in your body that most people have no idea are happening. Do you know you have fluid around your brain? Called supraspinal fluid. Do you know that fluid flows all the way down your spinal cord and back up in a spiral and charges the entire central nervous system? And it causes the skull to actually expand and contract to assist that process, and the sacrum to move forward and backwards in flexion extension. So your whole body is literally doing this all the time. It's a primary respiration. If that stops, you're dead. You can stop breathing. Your heart can stop beating, and you're still not dead until that rhythmic pattern in the brain also stops. But that charges the brain. Now, last point, the power of the will and the importance of self-control, both in the preservation and the recovery of health. The depressing and even ruinous effects of what? Anger, discontent, selfishness, or impurity. And on the other hand, the marvelous life-giving power to be found in cheerfulness, unselfishness, and gratitude should also be shown. So we're gonna spend some time looking at gratitude. And I'm gonna look at the physiology with you of gratitude. Now, last point before we start looking at the brain itself and gratitude and cell structures. Many people ask, why when I pray am I not healed? Now, why can't I pray for someone else and they're not healed when I ask the Lord to heal them? And there are a couple of comments that are, that are responded to here. Uh, Some have asked me, why should we have sanitariums? Why should we not, like Christ, 
Pray for the sick that they may be healed miraculously. I've wondered that. I've answered, suppose we were able to do this in all cases. How many would appreciate the healing? But more than that, would those who are healed become health reformers or continue to be health destroyers? That is, would they make a mockery of the laws of God and use God as a vending machine to give them health when they didn't know how to maintain it? And would go right back to their old ways and recreate the same pathology they had before. We've worked with many, many, many cases in oncology, cancer cases, and collaborative oncology. We take the best of both worlds. And we've seen patients recover from cancer. My comment to them every time is, the diet and lifestyle that got you well will keep you well. But if we revert, the diet and lifestyle that got you sick will get you sick again and kill you. And I've seen both. I've seen people stay recovered. I've seen people die in six months. They stay recovered if they stay the course. If they revert, they die within months. And it, it's painful to watch because it doesn't have to be. But that's how significant this is. So here's the key. Jesus Christ is a great healer. But he desires that by living in conformity with his laws, we may do what? Cooperate with him in the recovery and the maintenance of health. And I tell my patients this all the time. I say, I'm not in the business of healing you. Only Christ can do that. That's God's purview. I'm in the business of helping you cooperate with God. And that's my prayer with each and for each patient, that they learn through the Holy Spirit to cooperate with the Lord. The Holy Spirit guides the process of recovery, that they can cooperate with the Lord, that he can do his work in healing in them, all to his honor and glory. Nobody can take credit. Praise God. Nobody can take credit. There must be an imparting of knowledge of how to resist temptations. So it's our own, own responsibility to manage that. Now, my daughter became a Christian fairly recently. And she was reading something, and she called me up and says, Dad, do you realize that we have to suffer? I said, yeah, tell me more. No matter what, we have to suffer. We have to suffer the consequences of a lifestyle and sinful life that we lead, which will always lead to suffering. But we have to suffer by resisting temptation. Christ learned obedience, although he was son. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. In our sinful bodies, he was tempted in every way that all humanity would ever be tempted. That pulled on him continually. Not once did he yield even in thought to temptation. Had he, the controversy would have been in favor of Satan immediately. Done. But he didn't, praise God. That's our example. So we will suffer no matter what, accepted. <laughs> My daughter got that, and I really appreciate our discussion. Suffering is what happens here. Embrace it. We suffer for the Lord in the sense that we resist temptation, resist all the pulls of our carnal mind and the flesh, and that takes effort to submit to the Lord. First, submit to the Lord. Then resist the devil, then he will flee, as James says. So we resist that temptation. That's a suffering to resist it. Because the carnal mind is, wants to yield to that. Remember, the carnal mind is enmity with God. It hates God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither, neither indeed can it be. It's subject to a different law, the law of sin and death, not the law of God. Certainly not the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's subject to a different law. And it will suffer the consequences of its actions. I see this all the time in practice. People that lead lives that are contrary to the laws of God, moral, natural, physical, will suffer terribly. But I see this in people who are seeking to be sealed in the Lord. There's suffering there too, resisting all the temptations of this world. So I have a question. Have you ever killed someone? Have you ever had adultery? Have you ever molested a child? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever watched a movie where people have done that for you? Your brain does not distinguish what it sees from what you do. So we call it vicarious sinning. If you're watching someone else do those things for you on television or in a movie, or you're reading it in a book or in a magazine or the, all the garbage of the world, do you listen to it on the music of the world? 
you are sinning vicariously. Just because you're not doing it doesn't mean your brain doesn't know you didn't. Your brain doesn't distinguish what you're perceiving from what it's, what it's accountable for. So cut yourself off from the world. It's not worth it. You follow? It's not worth it. Who wants to be sealed? Who wants to see the Lord coming in the clouds of glory? Who wants to not taste death and perfectly reflect Christ's character and be used of the Lord to give the loud cry? Who wants to? Who yearns for that? We're told to pray for that daily. Pray for that daily. Yearn for that. But not just in name only, but in your very actions. By resisting temptations of this world, don't yield. It's not worth it. Now, I'm going to look at one other aspect with you here. Now, I, I love this part of the presentation. How are you doing? Yeah, awake, alive, breathing, digesting, falling asleep. <laughs> I want you to get this piece. I want, I want you to understand how the brain works and how the mind functions through the body and affects every single cell of your body all the time. So your thoughts affect the quality of your health continually. You're going to see it specifically how, about, how that works. I call this gratitude as a foundation for healing. So, uh, let's go here. All right. So, when we fell, we adopted a wrong spirit. What's David's prayer? Same. Renewing me a right spirit. So, uh, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, when, when the um, Samaritans would not put Christ up for the night, they were indignant. They said, Lord, wilt that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume him, even as Elias did. Meaning they didn't really understand what happened with Elijah, but they wanted to get retribution to the Samaritans. But did Christ turn to them and say? He rebuked them and said, you know what, know what manner of what? What manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. They went to another village. Now, how many of us take things personally? <laughs> When's the last time that happened, if you recall the last couple of hours? Okay? We tend to take things personally all the time. Did Christ take things personally? No. He did not. He did not contend for his own rights. She said, even though it made his life unnecessarily difficult, he did not contend for his rights. When he was reviled, he reviled not. Can we do that? In ourselves, no. In him, yes. Only in him. So when you're tempted to revile or take things personally, stop and do what? Pray. Submit to the Lord. Say, Lord, let you be seen here, not me. I know what I'm tempted to do, but I don't want to do it. Only by your grace and by the gift of the Lord of Christ in me, the hope of glory, and your Holy Spirit doing a work in me that I can't do in myself, can this be accomplished. Let it be your words alone that are spoken. Let me see this other person through your eyes and have compassion on them. Let me hear them through your ears. You speak to them through using my mouth. But most of all, Lord, let them see you, not me. And you know what happens? They change. <laughs> because you've changed. And now there's a different dynamic, a different relationship going on between them and Christ. So it's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made us free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is one we want nothing to do with. But we know our own minds. Deceitful above all things and desperately what? Desperately what? Wicked. That's right. Who can know it? So it is doomed to death. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, examine the mind, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So we're judged by what we do. Now, 
Here's a key. How much disease originates in the mind? 90%. And I'm going to show you why that's a sobering thought and why it's true. So Satan is the originator of disease. And the physician is warring against his work and power. I tell my patients this all the time. I say, we're at war. And they get it. Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. No one's immune. Nine-tenths, 90% of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Home trouble, remorse for sin, erroneous doctrines, distorted views of the character of God. 90% originates in the mind. Now, the brain is an organ, an instrument of the mind. So your mind, which is an extension of the spirit, requires a brain to function through, otherwise it can't affect you. There's no you to affect. So the brain is the organ and instrument of the mind, and it controls the entire body. Literally. Do you know that you do not see through your eyes? You see in the back of your brain. You don't hear through the ears. You hear in the, in the middle of the brain, the temporal lobes. You don't smell through the nose. You smell at the, the base of the brain. You don't feel touch in your skin. You feel it in the brain. All your motor functions originate in the brain. Your brain controls the entire body. In order for other parts of the body, of the, of the parts of the system to be healthy, the brain must be healthy. When the Lord healed us, he healed our brains that our bodies could receive messages from heaven and be moved into health. So when you're cleansing the body, it's not just your liver or your colon or your lymphatics, or your big toe. It's your brain that you're deto detoxing and cleansing, big time. That must happen. In order for the brain to be healthy, the blood must be pure. Now, have you ever tried eating hostess Twinkies and have pure blood? Some of you may have tried. <laughs> or drinking soda pop, or eating refined sugar, eating red meat, or fish, fowl, eggs, or dairy. I'm going to step on some toes, forgive me. When I do a brief talk tomorrow during this health nugget time, I'm going to talk specifically about abstemiousness. I love that word. You know that began on the, in heaven, on, on, in Eden, actually, when the Lord said you can eat of every tree but not of this one? That's abstemiousness. Stay away from the things that harm you. I'm going to talk about the things that harm you specifically, so that your blood can be pure. Tomorrow night, we'll talk about the things that help you. If by correct habits of eating and drinking, the blood is kept pure, the brain will be properly nourished. Um, okay. Now, I love this second statement. The power of the will, the second statement, and the importance of self-control, both in the, presentation, the preservation and in the recovery of health. The depressing and even ruinous effects of anger, discontent, selfishness, and impurity. We read this earlier. And on the other hand, the marvelous life giving power found in cheerfulness, unselfishness, and I underlined what? Gratitude should be also shown. Now, the rest of this talk is going to be focused on gratitude. Physiologically, not just psychologically. Gratitude is the one emotion above all others that creates healing on the heart and the brain and throughout your body. And I'm going to show you exactly how. The quality of being thankful is gratitude, readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness. What did Jesus show everyone he met, even as a child? Kindness. Even as brothers that really made his life very difficult, or people wanting water or food, and he gave them his. He showed kindness continually. Do we? Do we go out of our way to show kindness to people that are in desperate need of it? And who isn't? The Lord says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, and be thankful unto him and bless his name. Being unthankful leads to corruption. And we'll see how. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools 
and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. So when we worship not God, but anything else that you choose to make your God, it will always lead to corruption. Always. In what state is the world today? Intense corruption. It doesn't take much to appreciate that. Is it going to get worse? Resoundingly, yes. We haven't reached the bottom yet. It will soon. But there's some events to occur yet that haven't happened as yet. If you've studied prophecy, you'll appreciate that. So things are going to get progressively more corrupt. Sometimes it's hard to believe, <laughs> but it will happen. So giving thanks is key. Now, I love this. I just checked it in the Bible. I thought, how many times does it talk about thanks, rejoicing, praise, honor, faith, blessing, gladness, giving glory, joy, and believing? 2,694 times in 1,189 chapters in the Bible. So the Lord regards this as important. But why does the Lord emphasize praise and thanksgiving? So let's understand the physical and spiritual effects of attitude. Now, in a moment, I'm going to start showing you graphs of the brain and the heart in states of gratitude and states of resentfulness. You're going to see the difference. We'll talk about what the difference means in your body. Now, I love this statement. Even though your thoughts must be brought into subjection to the will of God, your feelings under the control of reason and religion. That's, that's what we're asked to do. Do we do that? Or do we let emotion take over? If the thoughts are wrong and the feelings are wrong, those combined make up the moral character. So is the moral, moral character right if the thoughts and feelings are wrong? Not possible. So guarding our thoughts becomes critically important. Bringing every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Jesus Christ. To whom was he obedient? His Father, our Father. That's what the Lord is asking us to do. Have you ever noticed your thoughts? <laughs> it's not pleasant. Okay, the mind goes in places that is dangerous to go. So the Lord is asking us, bring them back. Submit to the Lord. Yield your will to the Lord. So let, let these thoughts, Lord, be your thoughts, not mine. Let this mind be me that was also in Christ Jesus. Let me be renewed by the, let me be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Totally dependent upon the Lord. Take my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. Create me a clean heart. Renew me a right spirit. I want to be a partaker of the divine nature. All things are passed away and all things are made new. You know these quotes, right? You ever dwell on them? Yearn for them? Pray for them? Live as if they are in Christ? and ask him continually, and rejoice that it's done. Now, thoughts and even subtle emotions influence the autonomic nervous system. Now, your autonomic nervous system, have you ever heard of that part of the nervous system? Anybody? The autonomic nervous system is responsible for all the things you don't control. It controls your heartbeat, your breathing, your blood flow, your digestion, urination, your brain function that you don't think about. All is autonomically derived. It's an incredibly vast nervous system. And it interacts with the digestive system, the cardiovascular system, immune system, the hormonal system. In fact, we call it the neuropsychiatric digestive immune and, uh, well, you can put them all together, system. <laughs> There's a field in medicine that has all that together, looking at how those systems totally interact. It's incredible to study. So here's just a simple view of the autonomic, autonomic nervous system. Um, yeah. It controls everything that you don't. Um, it determines that you stay upright, that you can reach for a glass of water and get it to your mouth, that you can find a fork, hold on to it, and feed yourself, that you can walk to where you want to go and sit down and not collapse, that you can lie down and sleep. Yeah. Do you know how much is taken care of for each one of us? Huh. Continually? When the Lord made us, 
and continues to uphold us by the right hand of his power, of the power of his right hand. Continually. We're in his hand continually. Do we know that? And do we live as if we appreciate that? I pray that we do. So the autonomic, autonomic nervous system is made up of two parts, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Have you ever heard of sympathetic nervous system? It's the fight or flight nervous system. You've heard of that one? Well, there's actually four parts to it. Fight, flight, fake, or fold. In biology, we know that to be true. So if someone challenges you or uh, says something you take personally, you tend to want to react. That's a, that's a fighting response. If they're too big <laughs> or it's too much to bear, you want to just run. If you can't do either one, you're going to fake or fold. Just give up. All those are just strategies to survive. The parasympathetic nervous system is designed for resting, recovery, and digestion. When you sleep, it's dominant. When you're resting, it's dominant. And each has opposite functions to each organ of the body. For example, uh, the sympathetic ner nervous system, your pupils have to dilate to let more light in to, get, to not run into stuff when you're running. Um, it inhibits salivation, so you're not trying to digest food when you're active and try to get something done. It accelerates the heartbeat, relaxes the bronchi, so you get more oxygen, etc. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system does just the opposite. So this, this is how they interact. Now, there's another nervous system. I read this book years ago by Dr. Becker. He's an, an orthopedic surgeon. And they were looking for ways of helping people recover from malunion or nonunion fractions. So if a person broke a bone and scar tissue formed, and for whatever reason it wouldn't heal, that was not good. And you can't use that part of the body. So they started researching how to help this heal, and they found another overarching nervous system in the body that he called the healing nervous system. And it turns out to be a DC or direct current nervous system, not following the nerve uh, pathways that we think of as one neuron connected to another neuron, but in fact, it deals with the coverings of all the nerves, the Schwann cells and glial cells. So the packing cells and covering cells is its own nervous system and carries information, we, we found out, through the body simultaneously. It's called the healing nervous system. So this book called The Body Electric describes that whole picture and it's brilliant research. But what we appreciate is that when your mind starts contemplating about healing on Christ, now, if your thoughts are trained on God, is that going to bring about healing or disease? Healing. Pardon? Healing. healing. If your thoughts are focused on the carnal mind, on the world, on the ways of the world, is that going to bring about healing or disease? Disease. It's that black and white. And the thoughts are carried through the entire body simultaneously, everywhere, at one time. No, no part of the body is missed. Do you know you have a nerve to every single cell of your body? That information is transmitted through the DC network. Now, this is amazing to me. We're going to start looking at details here of the cell and frequencies. As an uh, entomologist, he's a, a bug specialist, um, Dr. Philip Callahan. And I met him. I flew him out to my, my, my place in southern Oregon years and years ago when he was still alive. He was doing research for the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, on how to deal with bugs. He was a bug specialist. Um, fascinating guy, brilliant scientist. And what he found was there's a system of measurement in physics called infrared interferometry. And it's a way of finding out the frequency characteristics of what you're, ever, what you're trying to measure. So he had this idea that a moth is attracted to the external sex enter pheromone of another moth to mate. It's also attracted to the host plant, so it can eat. How does it do that? How does it know that? So he measured the antenna patterns of each moth, and he, he pumped it with the wing beat frequency of each moth. And he found the exact frequency characteristics of the antenna matching the exact frequency characteristics of the external sex enter pheromone and the exact frequency characteristics of the host plant. So by flying by the wing beat frequency, it was pumping the atmosphere to spike certain frequencies of what it was looking for as chemistries from the pheromone and the, and the plant that it would feed on. 
and it would hone in on that information. And it honed in this way, not straight, but like an airline flies this way to get to its target. It never flies straight. That's not how uh, travel occurs in the air. It's always moving this way, trying to veer to stay on course. Well, that's what moths do and insects do. And so he found out the exact frequency matches precisely and published this data. So I read his research and I talked to him. I said, uh, we're doing the same thing with the human body. He was very interested. So I flew him and a couple of other scientists out to our place in Southern Oregon years and years ago. We developed proof of concept that the body works the same way. We're not beating wings, but what in our body is beating continually? The heart. It's an electric field that's generated continually throughout our bodies. That's why you can do an EEG or an EKG from your extremities and tell what's going on with the heart, because that electrical impulse is spread throughout the entire body. So as the heart is beating, it's pumping information that every cell in the body picks up. And as you think, those thoughts translate also as frequencies which are measurable that every single cell of your body is picking up. So it's picking up not just chemistries, but also frequencies of your thoughts. Are you following? We're able to measure that. But this is what stimulated our research in that direction. And he was just elated that someone pick up his research and, and extend it to humanity, to what happens in the body. But here's what happens. So here's the membrane of your cell. In your cell, every single cell of your body, you have antenna that pass through the membrane. They're called proteins. And those proteins act like antenna, and they have charges on either side that's positive and negative. They're picking up information of chemistries by receptors, but they're also picking up information of frequencies from your very thoughts pumped by your heart. So it's affecting what goes on in the cell carried by those antenna into the cell through the chemistries that the cell's generating from the nucleus. So it's telling the nucleus what to produce so the cell can do its functions based upon the thoughts you harbor and the foods you eat and the chemistries that are circulating through your body. Now, genetics. You've heard that word genetics, right? And that's a huge field. Functional genetics is a very rapidly growing field right now to know what to do with genes that people thought you couldn't do anything about. Well, we can. We can create a lifestyle that does an end run around genetic mutations. We learned how to do that, and that's ongoing research. Now, you have genes that turn on and off for health and disease. Did you know that? You have certain genes that turn on for health, other genes that turn on for disease. And guess what controls them? Your thoughts and your lifestyle. If you eat garbage, guess what you're turning on? Cells that control disease. If your thoughts are of the world, guess what you're turning on? Cell, the genes that control disease. If your diet is pure and you're eating out of the garden, the way we're designed, we'll talk about that more tomorrow. You turn on genes that code for healing. If your thoughts are the thoughts trained on God, guess what kind of genes you turn on? The code for healing. Now, there's also something called the epigene. You ever heard of that one? Or epigenetics? These are informations, information that is transferred from one generation to another, not through the genome, but through the epigenome, which is a structure in the genes itself, around the gene, that codes for what genes are going to release for healing and what genes are going to release for disease. So we can carry patterns generationally. The sins of the father visited three and four generations. That's a true statement genetically. And we see that and how it's coded. This is not just um, some unknown concept. It's a known concept. Through the epigenome, we transfer information from one generation to another. Now, do you know how sick our race is becoming? There's a lecture by John Sanford given at uh, Loma Linda. He wrote a book called Genetic Entropy. He's out of Cornell. I read his book, listened to his lectures, and I was in, I was in awe. What he showed was our genome is degrading. 
Does that surprise anybody? <laughs> His comment was, don't make any plans after 2095. Why? We will become extinct as a race. Our genome is degrading so fast that we'll get to the place where we cannot reproduce. He said, by 2095, he's predicting. Now, how did he prove that? It's what's called the biologic degradation curve. So he said, how do I demonstrate this? So he went to the Bible. And he took the, the ages of the patriarchs to the flood, then the ages of the patriarchs after the flood to David and from David to Christ. And he showed the progression of the biologic deg degradation curve that was an exact fit. It fit perfectly to the age matches of the patriarchs all the way down to Christ in his time, on to our day. And at the end of the curve, we can't reproduce. We'll be gone extinct as a race. Is that a surprise to anybody? And it's going faster than just age accountability. We're damaging our environment so much that we're destroying our genome. So in short order, there will be no more human race to save. The Lord must come lest there's no flesh left to save. That's a true statement. All right, let's go here. Now we know that during stress of any kind, we're going to look, a little, we're going to look tomorrow at how stress actually happens in the body what happens when you're under stress, and how you can begin to recover from that. But under stress, there's more sympathetic activity and less parasympathetic activity. So you're more driven to fight, flight, fake, or fold than you are to recover and rest and digest. The result is increased strain on the heart, as well as more strain on the immune system and the hormonal system. You ever had a problem with the hormonal system? Then you can't sleep? <laughs> are you hot flash? or you get PMS, and you just can't control emotion easily, or your sugar drops, or your testosterone drops, and you get weaker, and you start wrinkling, sagging, and getting weaker over time. This is what happens over time when the system degrades. Stress drives that. So there's a, a measure that's been developed in cardiology called heart rate variability. Now, heart rate variability is the resting phase of the heartbeat. So you have a lub-dub, 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 lub-dub. Well, the distance between the lub and the dub and the lub of the dub is measured as a heart rate variability. It's either regular or irregular. Now, under extreme emotion, the heart rate variability becomes erratic. It's more ordered under positive emotional states. We're going to look at what that looks like in a moment. So, your rest and digest system, your parasympathetic nervous system, tells the heart to slow down. When it's functional, the lub-dub, lub-dub, there's more time frame between the lub and the dub, the heart rate variability increases. If you're not in that state, but you're in fight or flight, the heart speeds up. So lub-dub, lub-dub, there's less time between each lub and dub, each contraction of the atria and the ventricles, and now the heart rate variability gets smaller and more erratic. And you can see what this looks like. And it's an indication of stress, illness, or overtraining, for example. So here's what I'm talking about. See that lower figure? That's in a state of appreciation or gratitude. Now, a person was just asked to remember when they were grateful about something, just to recall it in their mind. When they were in that state of just recalling it, this is what happened to the heart. It went into a state of regularity. So sincere positive feelings, like appreciation, created this highly ordered and coherent pattern. Um, and the cardiovascular system was functioning the same way, as opposed to the upper curve that has to do with frustration. The person just asked to recall a circumstance in which they were frustrated. That's not actively being frustrated. It's just even recalling being frustrated. The pattern became jerky and random. And that was triggered by just a sense of feelings of anger or frustration. Or anxiety, in this case. It's erratic. Um, let me go here. Now, this amazed me. When I started studying this years back, some scientists got the brilliant idea of putting these frequencies to music. 
and it was ingenious. So I listened to some of the soundtracks of the heart rate variability. A healthy heart sounded like Mozart. It was point counterpoint. It was alive, exciting to listen to, and you felt this capacity to adapt to anything. Didn't matter what was going on around you. You were just adapting and joyful. I don't know which most part Pete that would be, but it was like Mozart. And most researchers agreed to that. It then measured the heart rate variability of someone that was dying. And it sounded like a funeral dirge. There was no adaptability, no variability, no capacity to enjoy the changes of life. Huge difference between the two, Mozart and a funeral dirge. But that's what the heart literally sounds like in those two states of health and severe disease. It was noticeable, you could hear it without any question. So poor adaptability, we see this rapid pattern. Um, frustration, same thing, but down below, appreciation. It's completely coherent. Now, um, let me go to this one. All right, now this is a pattern on the left you'll see that after 300 seconds, five minutes, a person was asked to train to a sense of gratitude. When that happens, the breathing, the heart, and the brain all came into, same, into sync, all three. The breathing, the heart, and the brain. Now when that happened, what do you think happens to the cells of the body? It's getting that rhythmic pulse from the brain, from the heart, from the breath, but especially the brain and the heart, especially the heart, and it's transmitting information to the body through that DC network nervous system. The brain's entrained to the heart rhythmically. It's sending impulses to every cell of your body. What's the body doing with that? It's healing. It's healing. Now, if you're in a state of frustration or anger or resentment, what do you think happens to the body with that? It can't heal. It goes into states of degeneration. So, let's look at this. Um, all right, so this is the brain waves on the bottom and the heart waves on top, and they completely entrain to each other in a state of gratitude or appreciation. Now, I'm gonna finish up this way. There's a risk of developing heart disease that's increased when people tend to vent their anger or people that repress anger. Either way, if anger's in there and you let it out or you don't let it out, either way, it's gonna be a problem. And people are at higher risk of mortality when that occurs. Now, this is what happens to your immune system. Look at the lower figure. In a state of anger, your immune system depresses and it takes six hours to begin to come back. This is the immune system affecting the gut. So have you ever had a meal and then gotten angry with someone? <laughs> it's a problem. Whereas if you have care for someone, the immune system is peaked and then slowly goes up over time, is improving. So what does the Lord tell us? A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of merry heart has a continual feast. These are not just idle words. These are truths physiologically. The heart of the righteous studies to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds hearing to his lips. I love the way James puts it. Be slow to speak, swift to hear, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. So forget about being angry. That's one thing my dad taught me. He says, Jim, never get angry. I thought, sounds good. <laughs> Only in the Lord can that happen. Only in the Lord. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. And that's what it does. Literally, destroys the body. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. This is, uh, to me, profound. One thing my wife and I study a great deal of is this process of sealing. 
Um, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question to this group, I think. Who believes we're at the end of time? Okay. What's the Lord doing right now? Where is he? In the heavenly sanctuary? What, what apartment? In the most holy of holies. What's he doing there right now? That he began in 1844. Cleansing the sanctuary of sin. So as he does that in the sanctuary in heaven, what's he doing in our hearts? Same thing. Cleansing us of sin. As he cleanses us of sin, what does he want to fill us with? His very spirit. What happened in Matthew read that demons were cleared, but if they weren't filled up with the, the love of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord, 10, 7 to 10 came back. They were worse off than they had been before. So as we confess our sins, truly confess our sins and repent, and truly yearn to sin no more. That's not, that's not just platitudes. I came to this denomination very late in life, as I said, I was 52. So when I read these things, they're not platitudes, they're realities, they're, they're life. These are words of life, not just words that are nice ideas to contemplate. These are words of life, they're words of truth. They're words that life is dependent upon. Otherwise, it's called death. And I know too well what that would be like, so I have no interest in going there. So these are words of life. So so the Lord is doing a work of cleansing in us now. Do we submit to that? Do we want that to happen in us? Do we want to be sealed in the Lord? that we can't be moved intellectually or spiritually at all, because the world will try to move you. Satan wants you back in his camp. Do you want to go there? I pray resoundingly, no. You are bought with a price by Christ. You're his. So submit to him continually. Now, let him do a work in you that you can't do in yourself. So let me look at this one uh, Ending quote. Not a single tendency or inclination of flesh of the flesh was ever allowed the slightest recognition, even in thought, by Christ. But every one of them was effectually killed at the root by the power of God, which through divine faith he brought to humanity. Praise the Lord. So the Lord brought this to us. Do you get that? The Lord brought this ability to us. It's not from us, it's from him, from the Lord. He brought it to us. Now let's go further. Yet not a single tendency or inclination of the flesh was ever allowed the slightest recognition, even in thought. And then, uh, this is how A.T. Jones put it, and this victory which Christ wrought out in human flesh is brought by the Holy Spirit to the rescue of every human and everyone in human flesh who today believes in Jesus. No, I don't know how you can sit there. I, I jump for joy. I, honestly, this victory which Christ has wrought out in Christ, in our flesh. Now, when did he do that? How many years ago? In, our, in, our, in your flesh, in my flesh, how many years ago did he wrought out this victory? 2,000, approximately. So 2,000 years ago, Christ wrought out this victory in my flesh, in your flesh, in all of our flesh, human flesh and conquered sin and death for all humanity, conquered every temptation for all humanity that would ever live. But by the Holy Spirit, this very presence of Christ himself comes to the believer. Do you believe that? The very presence of Jesus. I don't know where I was it like last week, and it just hit me. So Jesus, you're here. Praise your holy name. Your presence is here. I, all I could do is just, I don't sing, but I rejoice. <laughs> My wife asked me not to sing, and I appreciate it. She, she can sing, but I don't. Maybe in heaven I'll be able to sing, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. To me. But I can rejoice wherever I am. How often does Paul say to rejoice? Always. How often does Paul say to pray? Unceasingly. What about when things are going really, really bad? Do you rejoice? Yes. 
Why? Will things get really good after they've gotten really bad? In the Lord, yes, it will always be resolved. So don't wait for the resolution. Rejoice even before then, anticipating what the Lord will do, and you get to watch it happen. So don't waste your time not rejoicing. When things are going bad, rejoice. When they're going great, rejoice and pray and invite his presence into you continually, and it's there. The moment you ask him, he's there. He's never not there. When I came to him, I've been trying to find the Lord all my life, and I was bashing at the door, trying to get into his kingdom. And then I read, wait a minute, Revelation 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I said, you mean the doorknob's on my side? If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. That's a true statement. And that's what he did in my life. I opened the door of my heart. I thought, finally, I get to see God face to face or know God face to face. And I did. I, sh I shared that in the testimony when I was here before. And the Lord came into me. And his presence is with me. And when I'm not concentrated on him or focused on him, I'm not aware of it. But when I am, his presence is there continually. Count on it. It's, he can't not be there. He will never forsake us. And I love this as the punchline. Thus, the deliverance from the guilt of sin and from the power of sin which holds the believer in triumph over all the desires, the tendencies and inclinations of a sinful flesh through the power of the Spirit of God. This is wrought today. When? This is wrought today by the personal presence of Christ Jesus in human flesh in the believer, precisely as it was wrought by the personal presence of Christ in human flesh when H.E. Jones wrote this in 1900, 1800 years and 70 years ago. Now, let this one in. Christ overcame sin in human flesh 2,000 years ago. Yes? Praise God. Did it stop there? No. Here we are 2,000 years later. His very presence in, is in us, in our human flesh now, doing the same thing wrought in human flesh 2,000 years ago in our flesh today doing that work in us today, this very moment, preparing us for translation, preparing us to be sealed in the Lord, preparing us to live a life conducive to being in heaven with the holy angels and the Lord himself, the Father and the Son. Anybody hear that? Can you let that in? This is the sealing message, brothers and sisters, beloved. This is the sealing message. Christ in you, the hope of glory, of his very character being wrought in you. As it was put in human flesh 2,000 years ago, so is his presence in you this very moment as you submit and receive his presence. It's there. It's palpable. It's knowable. There's not a question about it. I pray that I'm preaching to the choir, that you know it, and realize that work is being done in you today exactly as he did it in human flesh 2,000 years ago, but today in you now. Then you get to demonstrate Christ to the world, that he's lifted up in your very character. And he's lifted up, what does he do? He draws all men to himself. You don't, he does. As A.T. Jones put it in another place, Jesus is just looking for a place to reflect his glory. Your part is to put your will on the side of Christ. When you will, yield your will to his, yield your will to the will of Christ, he immediately takes possession of you. Wow. And works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Your nature is brought under the control of his spirit. Even your thoughts are subject to him. Now, that's a sobering concept. But here's the beauty. If you can't control your impulses or your emotions, as you may desire, you can't control the will. That's the one thing we have control over. To whom do I submit? 
and thus an entire change will be wrought in your life. When you yield up your will to Christ, your life is hid with Christ in God. And I've contemplated that line often, and I so appreciated this comment about that line. How I want to be dead to myself and hid with Christ in God. It's about yielding my will to him. You have a strength from God that holds you fast to his strength and a new life, even the life of faith is possible to you. And then, as we mentioned, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. But what does that mind do? It brings his humility into your life. No more pride. Your life is selfless, self-denying, and self-sacrificing, and you will in obedience with the things that you suffer. Obedience to the Lord, and you welcome the suffering, as strange as that may sound, because you know the work that's going on as you suffer, the work of obedience to the Lord. And when you do, your thoughts are trained on the Lord. As your thoughts are trained on the Lord, what happens to your body? Is Christ healthy? Perfectly. Can we be healthy in Christ? It's not a question, but I pray that it becomes our experience. I think we're there. Thank you so much. Now, tomorrow, um, my wife will be directing the Sabbath school. I love her studies. Um, she actually brought me to the Lord, and she's a brilliant Bible student and Bible worker. And she'll also, she and I will be doing the sermon. I'll be doing an introduction to her testimony, which is very powerful on healing. And then tomorrow afternoon, I'll be doing a talk on the law of dissipative structures and a lot that goes along with that so you understand the details of what healing looks like and how you can facilitate that specifically. It's not just pie in the sky stuff, although that's good stuff, but it gets into very practical work. And then tomorrow evening at 6.30, I believe, um, we'll be doing a question and answer. It says called Time with the Doctor. How many people actually get to spend time with the doctor and have to pay for it? And I'm happy to do that. So you, you can ask any question you want. It doesn't matter to me. I use it as a tool for teaching. It would be my pleasure to do that. So thank you again very much. And Pastor, thank you.